Good afternoon. Welcome to the first of our 2024 webinar series, Design Timber. My name is Matt Milton. I'm Editorial and Publications Manager here at Timber Development UK. In a minute, we'll be hearing from the team behind the fantastic new temple complex. But just while everyone's arriving, I'm going to say a few short words about Timber Development UK. We are both a young organisation and a very old organisation because TDUK was formed in 2021 to merge TRADA and the Timber Trade Federation, the TTF, to bring together every part of the timber sector, from supplier to specifier and all points in between. So here are our three key missions to connect the supply chain, to lead best practice, to accelerate a low carbon future. We carry out these mission statements with events like this one and uh, via our ever-expanding resources library and the work we do with policymakers and politicians to really fight Timber's corner. Um, here's a snapshot of just a couple of our recent outputs. You can see our quarterly magazine there, Designing Timber, which showcases everything that's exciting and inspiring in the world of timber design. You can see one of our numerous case studies there. That's uh, Durley Chine Environmental Hub which um, is also going to be a topic in one of our later webinars in this series. Um, you can see Timber Policy, a new report we just published, which showcases what various countries around the world are doing in order to incentivize um, timber as a construction material. And one I'm particularly excited about, which is our 2020, 20, 2024 excuse me, embodied carbon data for timber products. Now, th this, I think, could be a real game changer for designers because it tells you what the embodied carbon is for all the most common timber types and products. So it covers things like OSB, chipboard, hardwood, softwood, CLT, glue lamb, and others. So if you do want to build with timber, this will tell you what your embodied carbon footprint will be. Um, so yes, we have lots of great free resources. So do go and explore our website if you're not yet familiar with it, but it does really pay to be a member. It's surprisingly exp inexpensive and can benefit your business in very direct ways. Um, we've just launched a um, member directory, for instance, Find Your Timber Partner, which can put you right in front of potential clients that are interested in timber. That's just one of the many benefits of membership. So here you can see the upcoming events in our webinar series, um, the black and white building to um, the boathouse, a lovely um, small project. Um, and Eaton Sports and Aquatic Centre, and um, the uh, um, uh, building at NMIPE. So yes, lots to look forward to, um, but that's enough from me. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over now to um, Steve Wilkinson from James Gorse Architects, who's going to be our first presenter today, um, showing you the new temple complex. Okay, hopefully you can all see the first slide. Um, thank you, Matt, for that um, introduction and Bryony for the invite here today uh, with Timber Development UK. Um, it's, uh, the temple has been a really important project for us over the past six years. It's been a labor of love um, for all involved and we really appreciate the opportunity to be here um, to, to talk to you about the journey that we've been on. I'll start by presenting the building really as an architectural conception. Um, the practice was selected um, following a two-stage design competition in 2018. And we were appointed by the client, the White Eagle Lodge, who are a multi-faith, non-denominational um, spiritualist society. And interestingly for us, the brief didn't come, if you, if you imagine in comparison to mainstream religions, the brief didn't come with a predetermined set of spatial parameters within which to design the building. Actually, the brief was born out of three years of careful, uh, measured contemplative conversation with the client and consultation with the community. And considered thought was really given to um, multi -faith, designing for multi-faith visitors but also architecture as sacred expression. 
And so first we look to the landscape. So the site is located in the South Downs National Park with expansive views of the south towards the south coast. It sits on the border of Hampshire and West Sussex. And we discovered that there an ancient pathway exists, a footpath that maps the route um, used in Tudor times, transporting timber and specifically oak from ancient oak forests in the north of Hampshire down to the south coast and the shipbuilding city of Portsmouth. And along its way, this footpath passes clay beds and also chalk aquifers that filter the chalk streams that are unique to the region. And the building makes use of each of these materials. We, we used a facing clay brickwork and set that into a chalk lime mortar. And then the entire building is timber framed. And we select these materials to be self-finished and, um, and really kind of to create a concise and not harmonious material palette um, that would encourage contemplation within the building, but also draw the eye out to the landscape and the changing colours of the sky. More locally, um, and really importantly to the client, it's believed the temple location is grounded in an ancient ley line connecting sites of spiritual significance in the south of England. This line or earth energy, as we call it, runs on a east-west axis directly through the center of the site, centered on newly landscaped gardens. So we had, we had fun with this. We, in, in the design stages, we, we attended site and we mapped um, these earth energies using the ancient technique of dowsing, um, which has been used for centuries to map earth energy um, vibrations. And it was believed that in the center of the site, these energies could be mapped on approximately 1.1 meter grid. This then, then became the structural grid used throughout the building. And you can see here how it's expressed in the glue lamp facade, the entrance portico, and also within the masonry construction in the base of the temple. And then we use the timber internally to articulate the internal spaces by exposing it. So the plan, it's really um, a rational plan organized as pavilions um, connected by a glazed cloister and wrapping around a central courtyard garden. And the internal program is loosely organized between sacred and secular on a divide through the central courtyard. I'll come on to the, to the internal program shortly, but that central courtyard has been sized strategically to match with the inner footprint of the temple. So you have this mirroring of sacred spaces, both within the building and within the, the landscape. So we worked with McWilliams Studio to design the courtyard garden as a real contrast to the surrounding English pastoral landscape. So it's a, a densely planted gravel garden. And the relationship of this courtyard um, to the inner sacred space was informed by studies of historic religious examples. Um, we were interested in Torone uh, Abbey. This is a 12th century monastery in the south of France with generous cloisters um, and moments to sit and um, sit and take in the, the planted courtyard. And you can see also in plan the balance here between the central courtyard and the inner prayer space. Similarly, um, other motifs, how we use light here, the, the curved um, windows in the nave of Torone, and on the right hand side, the individual prayer chapels in the temple. So the internal arrangement follows this um, procession of secular to ritual spaces, spaces moving from the northeast of the plan round to the southwest. So in the northeast, we have the entrance portico social foyer and visitor entrance and then a multi-purpose um, event space that can be used for yoga and um, lectures and we wanted this division this organization to be read in the facade of, or in the elevation and the external of the, of the building um, we see the open timber frame as welcoming and inviting to visitors 
And then we flip this in, in the temple where the masonry provides privacy to um, internal services of prayer. So the entrance, visitors enter in through a covered entrance lobby um, into a foyer serviced by a kitchen. And the kitchen also serves through a hatch to um, the, the lecture hall event space. Um, like I said, it's used for uh, yoga and all sorts of community activities. And then processing in the plan from east to west, following the path of the sun. So the plan contains an increasing hierarchy of sacred spaces. Here we have the, the library, followed by the meditation and meeting room. And finally, the um, individual prayer chapels. So these spaces are linked, but they're also accessed from um, the cloistered walkway. And as this wraps the garden, it exaggerates the processional aspect toward the temple prayer space. So the geometry, ge the geometry of the temple is um, really defined by its square base and circle clerestory window. And it looks to connect with um, symbology throughout, uh, used throughout antiquity with the square representative of earth and humankind and the circle, a symbol of the divine. And here we're really interested in that idea of architecture as a sacred expression and how the form of the temple could communicate its multi-faith function. So we looked at the 16th century um, golden temple in Amritsar, which has a square plan and four entrances on the four axial points. And we projected this ideology I suppose onto the, the footprint of the temple and it defined the four axial entrances. Now the structural modeling that Duncan will come on to shortly um, was really at its most complex uh, in this space, given the overhead glazing and the, the, the oculus. And by early analysis, we, we managed to get to the point where we, we where we were designing this building entirely in timber. So we managed to eliminate structural steel and that saved about 25 um, tons of carbon um, by using regenerative timber materials. And the engineer frame was also an opportunity to model and test in detail all of the junctions to create a family of details for prefabrication and to essentially eliminate the need for visual um, connections. And the species we used were Siberian March on the outside of the building. So moving from the exterior to interior, we then had a European spruce for the load bearing internal frame. And then finally, UK grown ash for um, loose furniture and some of the joinery. And at its most ambitious, um, this frame is lifted above the surrounding pavilions on top of the pendentive arch that you can see here. And in doing so, we form a 360 um, completely circular clerestory window, above which um, the curved glue lamb beams culminate in a 1.5 meter diameter glazed oculus. So here the timber frame is supported by a vaulted pendentive arch. Um, we call it the pendentive, which is an, essentially an elegant double curvature structure that connects back to a rich history of religious buildings. It's really defined as the structural device uh, employed wherever you have a square based plan supporting a circular dome. And it really refers to these triangulated sections beneath the dome that you can see here. And on the left here, one of the early renderings for the Bank of England by John Soane, and one of the earliest examples, the Hagia Sophia, in the 6th century Constantinople. So the pendentive was cast in 12 pieces using stone from the Italian Dolomites. This would have been the same stone that was used in the construction of the ancient city of Rome. Each piece was cast by Evans concrete and they created these beautiful moulds constructed in timber ribs and layers of curved plywood formwork. And they incredibly 
bent all of the steel reinforcement bars by hand to create these complex meshes that were inserted into the moulds to prevent surface cracking of the stone. And as the primary structural frame within the space, um, they were delivered to site before anything else. So they kind of stood there as this freestanding piece of sculpture. And at this point, we were reminded of the real acoustic challenge that we were dealing with, because you had this really intense acoustic focusing in the center of, of the space, despite none of the other building fabric being in place yet. So this was a challenge that we met with three different techniques. The first of which you'll have seen um, is the intricate dog tooth brickwork. So this was laid in a projecting texture and designed to scatter sound, reducing the overall acoustic central focus. And we took the angle of this offset for the brickworks um, and it was determined by these transept doors that you can see just behind the foot of the arch there that take you through to these prayer chapels. The second thing we did was to expose all the beams in the upper dome uh, to, revert, uh, to reduce the reverb and dissipate sound more evenly overhead. And finally, um, all of the joinery and the soffit in the temple in the, in the prayer space is um, constructed in a micro perforated ash, uh, which is acoustic, which increased the acoustic absorption. Um, as well as these kind of super technical acoustic ideas, um, the temple is also imbued with a whole load of um, geometries and mathematical ratios um, used to determine the size of the space. Some of the ones that you can see here are informed by the philosophical and spiritual beliefs of the client team. And you can see in section how some of them led to the um, overall sizing of the space as well as pieces of furniture, so the West Altar. And we also use the symbol used by the client, the cross within the circle. It's a repeating motif used throughout the building. And you can see here where it existed on posters that they distributed on the London Underground during the Blitz. And we took it through to the design of the furniture, you can see here in the lecterns, but also in the bespoke ironmongery. So the ironmongery in the building is designed to illuminate the symbol of the cross within a polished steel circle. And finally, outside of the building, um, the landscape provided a, a kind of beautiful um, rural setting, but it gave us a real problem in, in terms of the fact the building is almost entirely off grid. Um, there's no gas and only a very limited single phase power on site. So, in terms of servicing, all of the heating is provided by a ground source heat pump connected to underfloor heating. And that's powered entirely by a solar array on the north of the site. And one of the standout innovations, I suppose, is the um, low carbon alternative to air conditioning that we used. So beneath both the congregation spaces, um, we designed two shallow basements. Um, and these are used to draw air through into the building to pre-cool it in summer. In the temple, um, these air grills, external air grills, are positioned in the alcove seating on the principal facade. And you can see in this drawing on the left how air can be drawn through in summer, pre cooled in the basement, and then supplied into the congregation space if it overheats. And that's paired with high level louvers to purge warm air from the building. So that's me finished. I'll ha hang over, hand over to Duncan just on this image of the temple this time last year, uh, at a quiet moment before dawn. Um, Duncan will now take you through the structural design of the building. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, just while we're handing over to Duncan, I'm just going to encourage everybody to make use of the uh, Q&A function. Um, so if you, if you look at the various icons at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see the, see the Q&A button. So please do ask as many questions as you like of our, of our panelists today. Thank you very much. Um, I can pick one up already, Matt. They've uh, asked if the, the slides will be available. I think uh, a recording is going to be made available afterwards. Is that correct? So, yes. Uh, yes, I did. I did answer that question. But for, for everybody else, yes, th this is being recorded and will be put up on our um, YouTube, on the Timber Development UK YouTube channel shortly, where you can actually see um, plenty of other webinars from, from last year already. So, yes, watch out for that.
Okay. Um, can you see that? Am I sharing? Can anyone give me the thumbs up? You can see the screen that I'm sharing. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'm Duncan Walters from Meckles Lear Callahan. Hopefully, you know us. Um, uh, we did the structural engineering for this project. Um, so, this is the, the story in, 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 in those terms. Uh, I'll just give you a bit of background if you don't know us. Uh, we did a lot of work with Apple in glass, uh, pushing the sort of state of the art of the glass engineering forwards over the last 20 years, our, our 20th birthday next month. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, we, we, we kind of really like to push the envelope in terms of innovation and put a lot of money back into R&D within the office, allowing people to do what they want uh, and try and uh, both innovate, uh, use sustainable design techniques uh, and uh, work with industry to see what new new hybrid uh, approaches to, to design and construction there are. Uh, we use modern, modern kind of BIM tools uh, on all our projects and, and so this is a perfect project for us in terms of uh, being able to knit together BIM sustainability and, and timber design. Uh, so a fantastic opportunity. Um, there's a bit more. Uh, we, we have a facade team too, so we like to knit together the frame and envelope. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of our, our, our go-to we can. Uh, in terms of materiality, uh, we, we kind of dive in and get quite granular and, uh, and like to sort of try to be specialists in, in, in all material um, areas, both from bio-based regenerative materials all the way through to uh, more engineered materials um, and, and those in between, uh, and modern, modern methods of construction. Um, so starting off, the, the, the project came in 2018 with the assembly of the design team for the competition. And I think an interesting passage of four or five years where there's been a real emergence of an awareness of sustainability. Uh, and um, in fact, you know, JGA have been pushing that from the start. And we wanted to do something in timber. Uh, and it's just kind of interesting that the kind of uh, legislation or evolution of the understanding of that has kind of grown as, we, as we've moved through uh, the project timeframe. So at the start, um, we were working on the kind of the competition winning sketches, which at that point we'd done very little or, or probably nothing at, at this point. Uh, it, 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 was, it was entirely architecturally led uh, at this stage and we were just feeding off of the design sketches and renders that were uh, the winning entrance. Uh, you can see a lot of, a lot of uh, red sort of rubber uh, natural masonry here. And uh, I mean, um, the kind of, the shoulder blocks of this building around the temple were fairly uh, reasonable spans and scales, and you know, relatively, uh, you know, could be achieved with traditional approaches to joisted roofs and what have you. But in the actual temple space, um, that was certainly much more challenging in terms of the geometry we'd be dealing with, and so the masonry. Well, there was a question over the masonry at that point. Um, we had a kind of timber palette to go through, but the spans didn't warrant anything other than a a glue lamb uh, really internally for the sort of nine meter spans. And there was a, a predefined uh, um, grid on the site, uh, as you heard from Steve, the ley lines, 1.1 meter grid, which did feed well into the eight by four sheets of plywood you get to, to span over our 1.1 meter glue lamb spacing within the roof itself. Um, so the glue lamb was central view on here was was the approach and it created that fenestration that linked with the elevations in the facade and returned around a mitered corner and into the, the ceilings and created the, that kind of uh, um, patterns in, in throughout the run throughout the building um the the uh, pendentive dome at this point in these renders look pretty optimistic in a small hand laid brick from these renders so this was the challenge and uh, i think there was a lot of discussions around how we would achieve this that kind of approach would either need to be inset into a precast or a lot of centering in a very old fashioned traditional style to create uh, a working surface for you to lay bricks onto, which is quite uh, intensive labor wise, costly. And um, yeah, so the kind of change of direction occurred uh, 
um, at that point. Um, and we were looking at uh, larger monolithic elements, maybe a post-tension stone or a stone in compression if we could. There was this ring around the head of the pendentive dome that we knew we needed to effectively tie off to limit those kind of thrust forces from the lantern itself. And these are some early sketches of the load paths that we were needed to deal, deal with, how to like, take the loads down to ground, uh, uh, and what the challenges would be. Uh, it's the biggest challenge for us. This is the kind of first sketch plan uh, where effectively on one drawing we may, managed to kind of give the QS the, the kind of uh, the volumes and material, the typology. We had a beam block floor, it was trying to keep it low tech, affordable at a time when uh, you know, costing for the project with uh, this keen eye focus on the finance. Um, so you can see here we had the roof roof elements, and at this point we were keeping our options open in terms of the lantern structure itself. In the ground, we had good uh, site investigations showing pretty good uh, allowable bearing capacity, and as the building above ground is very much a joinery item, a very fine tolerance piece of cabinetry in a way for a building. Um, we actually did similar thing with the in the ground with very very narrow strip footings, a bucket, a bucket, a digger bucket width, 600 wide. They could barely fit the masonry on it, which was a bit of a complaint from the uh, uh, the ground worker at that point because he, he, he was suffering with his tolerances from the, the guy in the digger and the guy wanting to put a string line up. Uh, but I think that was worthwhile doing to save every ounce of uh, carbon for the project. Um, this is a section through uh, cloister in the uh, uh, the main kind of shoulder block of the building you can see here, just very simple uh, suspended floor, which allowed um, Skelly and Cooch to run their very low energy cooling system in the ventilated void and to keep it low cost in terms of uh, the QS wanting a beam and block floor and uh, also a very tricky access to site. So elements needed to be small and handleable. And for the same reason, the temple was dealt with in the same way, breaking it down into elements that could fit on the back of a high ab and be lifted into position on site, uh, having carried out the prep work. Uh, this is a kind of early sketch of the golden ratio that we were dealing with and trying to uh, have a look at some of these early Rhino models that came in from the architects, bringing them in uh, and seeing how we might distribute the forces in, within that space. Um, it's difficult to appreciate the uh, uh, the actual geometries, but it, it, this was a great image that Steve sent through that, that allowed us to understand the kind of Boolean difference between these elements to create the, the, the negative pattern of, of the final structural elements. And where those, uh, those cantilevered wing tips reach each other, they're only 150 mil deep. So it's quite, quite elegantly meeting there and understanding how this thing would come together on site and uh, be connected together and the tolerance is involved in that. Obviously, these people, uh, the, the building occupiers and building users are going to have, uh, you know, um, sort of uh, moments where they'd be able to scrutinize the work and, and the tolerances may be uh, picked at more closely than another, any other project that we're working on. Um, so, sort of recreating the accuracy of the, the early models that, that were being produced for the client visualizations. The, uh, uh, we have Pierre from from uh, Stone Masonry Company mock up a, a, a one in one in uh, fifty scale or one in twenty five scale model of this. It's a twelve meter diameter um, uh, temple space. So uh, this is a sort of table sized coffee table sized uh, version of it. Uh, I think there was some uh, uh, commercial challenges with delivering it in that way, it, it, and uh, you know it, it, the decision was taken to to. Uh, go with a poured stone um so this is a section view from our uh, revit model of of that uh and you can see the kind of geometries it creates in section uh, early kind of ideas of how we might uh, reinforce this we're using a dolomite uh white and white cement uh, mix that was going to be acid etched and uh, create a, a sort of surface texture to give a more natural effect these were our kind of pre class design intents, having known that we need to split this into 12 equal portions around the circumference uh, and understanding how we might tension up and connect each of these elements whilst transferring the forces between them. Uh, there's a, again more design intent for uh, Evans precast, who ultimately did it. Uh, we, we were thinking about uh, in situ pouring because of the difficulty logistically getting to site on such a narrow winding path to the site. Uh, this is the, some presence from the Aquatic Center using fill core as a 
uh, a material for um, pouring the mold into and creating the surface texture we wanted. This is our final element uh, strand model that uh, we were trying to understand what displacements we would expect if we used just the minimum reinforcement for these section sizes. Uh, uh, conveniently, uh, um, with uh, um, the outcomes that we, we've got very limited deflections and we were happy with that. Uh, then the kind of next challenge was achieving the tolerances and making sure we communicated those those forces back to Evans so that they could uh, they could design the connections. Um, so they were great. They, they produced a fantastic set of uh, uh, fabrication drawings, effectively, which is uh, you know uh, rare to see in in this type of project precast concrete being used. Uh, but they effectively uh, we went to this, their uh, factory in Derbyshire, where in fact timber is uh, you know still uh, used to quite an extent in terms of creating the molds for these these projects. Um, here are uh, the um, uh, some of the mods uh, on the day that we visited pouring some of the wings. And you can see they were, had to be cast upright so that all of the exposed surfaces, we were trying to control um, air bubbles and the quality of the finish, the, the, the surfaces that weren't within sight were at the top of the ring, if you like. And so uh, that, that helped to make sure that we, that we got the quality control that we needed. Um, this is a, a prefabricated cage that we, we were dropping in uh, on this little thing. This might run. We go. This is the, the dull white concrete going in. Uh, there's a super plasticizer and a viscosity modifying agent used in there to make sure that it's the right consistency. You don't get segregation in the mix and there is no air bubbles uh, uh, because they don't want to put a vibrator down into these machines. Uh, and the you know, quite, quite close reinforcement spacing used to control the uh, shrinkage cracking. Okay. So here's a couple that uh, were freshly freshly struck from the molds, and they actually used an acid etching on those afterwards to create this, the, the, the finish required. Uh, these are some of the bases we even had those precast. So everything was carefully procured in the same way as you would the, the frame above ground. Uh, this is the site waiting for those pieces to be delivered and shimmed into position. Tolerance has been very important on, on this project. Uh, you can see here section through our uh, ventilated floor construction, bringing that cool air in. And there you can see them sat on sleeper walls uh, just adjacent to the, the inner temple there. Uh, there was some touching up needed to be doing. I mean, it, it's very important that those edges uh, are, are, are massaged into a position that they, they, they uh, meet uh, neatly, um, and this is it. It's quite quite a thing on site going together. Um, so sustainability for the project in terms of the timeline, there's a kind of a growth in awareness of understanding that. And in fact, uh, conveniently, we, we were ahead of that curve. Uh, there was a good shot in the arm in in, in uh, 2019 in terms of architects and engineers declare, uh, but we produced our three options. Um, for the building in late 2018 for, for the costing and client approval. Uh, the the, the go-to initially was this uh, steel, steel lantern approach with the 12 segments. Um, and uh, we did a pretty early, early sort of uh, spreadsheet approach to establishing volumes and tonnages for each of the embodied carbons. I mean, at this stage, uh, the conversation around uh, um, uh, reclaimed and reused and harvested steel from other projects wasn't involved. So this was very much based on the kind of uh, off the shelf um, UK based um, uh, embodied carbon coefficients. But it was great to have a client that would support us in this and they picked the lowest embodied carbon uh, upfront approach, uh, which we went for. And you can see there that both the uh, sequestered values and the total values based on the risk guide uh, are included. So uh, we then uh, developed stage four design uh, on that principle using the timber approach, uh, limiting displacements. We didn't want that glass cracking. Um, and uh, we effectively had to isolate that, although there's probably some redundancy in all that glass, stiffening up the torsion, torsional twist forces in, inside the lantern. But uh, we, we, we wouldn't want uh, Nick to rely on that. Uh, I'll have to justify it. So um, we, we did a lot of prep work. This is our 
construction model, um, which we couldn't get the uh, masonry color right, uh, but uh, it, it's enough to build from. Um, so in terms of timber construction, controlling that and understanding the kind of the importance of uh, the quality of finish, we had uh, uh, a lot of conversations with Nick about making sure that the, the fixings are hidden using our experience from a few of our other projects, the Bitsu HQ, the, the black and white building, uh, Holland Park School, where we've learned that uh, it can be quite challenging both to create hidden fixing and for an installer to come in and actually make it fit with the tolerances involved on a, a live working construction site. Um, and here's a few views of the sort of Wartzel approach to the, the building site. Um, here's the uh, Oculus element going in. There is actually plugs that are installed below the, below those timbers, but very neatly done. You can't see them in the, the final version. Um, and the, we needed this frame to act as a moment frame. So this is effectively portalized in, in 48 directions. Uh, and so every one of these connections here, that these hidden connections, Nick managed to uh, achieve the stiffnesses we required to limit displacements. Uh, and here we go. Uh, there it is going up. Um, we had a good uh, uh, trip with the office went down last summer for our summer trip. It, it coincided with the one year's uh, defects visit. So I had a pretty pretty good set of photos to, to go with there um, as the office took the, the trip to site. And uh, yeah, it's great to be involved in a project where every surface has been engineered um, to, to express the architecture. Um, so it's been a bit of a gem for us to, to be involved with. Here it is with the, the staff enjoying it um, in July last year. So uh, I think that's uh, all. No, no, there's one more thing. Um, yeah, we have uh, the, in, the, the final measure on the embodied carbon is, is this one. Uh, it's within 10% of our original estimate back in late 2018. So we think that's a, that's a win. It's um, uh, achieved actually uh, on the final measure was an A, a rating when we've done the whole life cycle assessment because uh, the, the value on the right there is an estimated one based on our, uh, on our eco tool uh, value only, uh, assuming that the operational carbon um, uh, comes from this as a kind of a, a takeaway, but uh, having worked with Skelly and Kutri, we um, managed to measure a full assessment. And so we'll be sharing that at some point soon with you all. Um, so that's, uh, that's it from me. Um, and now over to Nick, who uh, had the challenge of building. I think you, your microphone might yeah. need. Thanks, man. I'll just share. Okay. Um, I trust everybody can hear me okay. My name's uh, Nick Horton from a company called Pace Grey Limited. Um, yeah, we were lucky enough to be introduced to the project by uh, Steve. Um, relatively early in, in the in the process, um, far far later than what we've just gone through with the uh, initial design stages. But uh, as soon as we started talking about how we're going to build the the project, and I think uh, Steve um, came across us from the uh, the structure we did up at the uh, Yorkshire Sculpture Park, known as the Western Building. And um, coincidentally, at the time, um, we started working with Ecclesi O'Callaghan uh, simultaneously on another project, which uh, Duncan also mentioned, the black and white building. So um, yeah, it's interesting how the, the, the paths cross. Um, at heart, we're a 45 year old uh, joinery company, a traditional joinery. And um, about 15, 20 years ago, um, we had the opportunity to start working in, in facades um, primarily um, right from the get-go in the in the composite market, so timber on the inside, aluminium on the outside, and that has taken over um, the business. We're pretty much now 90, 95 facades and everything associated with with facades, and this in in part is um, an example of that. Um, Duncan's spoken about the tolerances that were required in the building, not just for the structure, but uh, 
to satisfy the the tolerances um, with the uh, the Bico um, curtain wall system, we're obviously we're laying glass onto a, onto a timber structure. Those uh, tolerances need to be within plus or minus half a millimeters. And the normal way of combining or getting a timber frame specialist to build it and then have us glaze it afterwards has caused a few headaches. Um, and as a result of that, I think from contractual risk, um, we were invited to. Um, to tender competitively on this project by Beard for both the timber frame and the um, the, the glazing system, the Vico system. So um, obviously, primarily we're, we're looking at um, the, the timber um, structure here. I just wanted to talk about the, uh, the the timber sourcing, where we got the timber from, particularly the uh, from a sustainability point of view there. Um, we had some challenges because at the time that we, we were um, we were buying this timber, we were just about to come out of, out of Europe. And then we're going to um, the more practical things of actually uh, supporting the building, getting the building to stand up during the construction phase. And uh, we can just discuss a little bit about the brackets and um, and the challenges that uh, that Steve and Duncan have just told me about. Um, so here we go. This is the um, the timber sourcing we, we bought the, the timber for the project from a company um over in germany in the middle of the uh Bremen forest um it's schillerholz um their uh, factory plant is literally right in in, in the middle of the uh the, the, the forest down there and um, so all their uh timber is uh sourced locally a very short distance to travel from the uh from the forest to the, to the actual factory um their attention to detail even starts here. So they, they, they start by purchasing only the part of the, the tree that is most useful, uh, provides the, the highest yield to them. So they get the lower end of the tree, less the root bulb. And, um, and because there's less branch, well, there's no, no more little branches down there, it, um, it means that, sorry, um, it, uh, it, it means that there's less knots in there uh, for them to deal with further on in the process, which I'll come to in a, in a few slides time. At this part of the uh, part of the process, the whole facility is, is obviously set up to deal with pretty large timbers. Um, and it's pretty amazing when you see what uh, what size components these things get broken down to before they turn into glue lamb. Um, to say the obvious, they all start off uh, like this with full logs. Um, so the, the the first thing that needs to, to happen with the log is it gets uh, it gets um, cut on the on to the sawmill with a bandsaw, and uh, it's still recognised in the process as the most skillful um, operation because the guy with his eyes is literally orientating the um, the logs to to select the grain direction and uh, and get the maximum yield out of uh, out of any log that he's presented with. Um, once these um, logs are, are cut into the, um, the, the lamelle thickness that will be playing down to the lamelle thickness, so roughly 25 millimetres thick, um, they're taken away, uh, stripped, and put in a kiln to get uh, down to the required moisture content. Um, they aim for about 12% before they start the remaining um, process. And then once those logs are cut into to the section, in, in this instance, that uh, the, the um, White Eagle Lodge, there was a, a, a target or a prominent uh, dimension throughout the throughout the, the building was this 80 millimeter width. So once the, the lamelles were cut down to just above that, so they could be planed afterwards, um, it's still in a sawn state but kiln dried. They're put through a smart scanning uh, cross cut, and it's an automated process whereby there's a camera in that, uh, in that cross cut, any, any defect that it sees, whether it be a knot, a resin pocket, a split, whatever it might be, um, it literally come down and cut the knot out, which falls into the, in, into the tray below, and it continues uh, through the process. You'll see on the right-hand side there, the billets of, of different um, length sections that come out of these uh, lung lengths. They can range anything from 150 millimeters up to, up to one and a half meters. Um, and you do have the ability when you specify the timber from Schiller's to actually state what the minimum size um, lamella, the minimum size pieces you want within each lamella. Um, on the uh, 
White Eagle Lodge, we actually specified 150 with a um, for the internal um, uh, lamels and a slightly longer one, so he's, uh, less joints on the on the outside, which I think was uh, 1.5 meters. I have to check, but it was it, we, we have that flexibility uh, when we're purchasing the timber from those guys. Um, and after we've got that little um, that little uh, the, the small pieces, they're finger jointed in the length, glued back together again, and then finally put into a press to be um, built up into the depth of the beam that, uh, that we're looking to, uh, to use. Um, even at that stage, there's uh, a, a science behind how those lamelles are put together, um, just so they maximise the stability of the beam. They're, um, they're, they're combining straight grain with cross grain and, um, and building the beam up, up that, that way. Um, but once once it's actually come out of the press, it's uh, just put through a, a very rough uh, plane, so they can actually visually see any further defects, some uh, resin pockets in softwoods that might have opened up, or some shakes in the, in in any hardwood. They're repaired by hand, and then finally um, uh, dimensioned and, and packaged for, for for delivery. And what's interesting about the sustainable side of this is 70% of the log that turns up um, with the bark on it in the, in the yard off the back of the truck is used in the end product. That's, that's what we start working with. And the other 30% of the process, the sawdust, the shavings, um, are turned into, into wood pellets, which are um, then sold on for biomass. And anything else that is stripped off it that's not worthy of the biomass, the bark and the, uh, and the chippings are actually... Um, Put into the into the uh, furnaces in the plant to uh, fuel the um, heat the kilns for the for the drying process. So, all in all, a very slick um, operation. Um, Steve touched on this this earlier in in his uh, presentation. Um, we ended up um, in actual fact, I think it, I, I believe it, it was all to be large at uh, originally, but because of a um, cost constraints. We value engineered the project a little bit, and we ended up with a European spruce internally. So anything behind the glass line, anything behind the weather line is, um, is uh, made in European spruce. And because of the lack of durability of that uh, product, anything outside the glass line, so anything that is um, exposed to the weather is um, uh, supplied and manufactured in, uh, out of Siberian larch. And there was an exercise that Steve did over a number of weeks where he was trying out different coatings on uh, both the European spruce and the Siberian notch, di different coating inside, different coating outside to merge the two together. Because um, my understanding of, the, um, of the, the intent was that out of the 600 millimeter column, we want to see the glass line in, in the middle of it. Um, and by uh, getting consistency between the internal outside out outer timber, as you can see in the photographs of the finished project, um, I think we've achieved that. Um, and yeah, the, the, the other thing that just there is the um, the timber, which was unusually a pretty big piece of timber when they when they came over to us. They were um, uh, six meters length by stock. That's normally how we buy our, buy our timber in. But because of the spans that were um, involved in, in certain aspects of this, this project, they're over six meters and they only have a six or 12 meter press. So we ended up with a whole bunch of timbers, 80 by 300 by 12 meters, which uh, yeah, pretty, pretty sizable. And um, the other thing that we did, and um, just to maintain the quality to the project at that point in time is, um, it's the first time we've done it really. We um, bought the, the member sections from um, Schiller's in the 80 by 300. We also purchased the individual lamellas made in exactly the same um, processing plant and they were supplied to us loose so that we could actually bond those lamellas together in, in formed presses to um, create the, um, the, the, the uh, curved temple rafters. Um, just onto the, the, the system that we used, I think I might have mentioned it earlier and we've, we, we've worked with them for many years and we have a fantastic partnership with them. Um, RICO and the system, uh, the glazing system we use is the Firm Plus HI system. Um, not only have we got experience um, 
of many years working with them. There's a whole bunch of generic test data out there, CWCT testing, acoustic tests, um, and, and so on, thermal tests that uh, we can rely on. And over the years, um, we've carried out a lot of uh, project specific testing. Um, so we're very, very comfortable with it. And um, we use the flexibility of that system to form the basis of us to design the um, design the glazing system on. Um, interesting enough, the one of the benefits of the, the RICO system is that there is a um, it, it's available in 50, 56, 76 and 96, but they all interlock together. So I believe it was to, to maximize the, 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 the height of the glass. We've used a 56 millimeter transom. So the horizontal beams are, are 56 millimeters and the verticals are all 80 millimeters and those sections all slotted together seamlessly. Um, the other thing that I've put on that um, on that slide there is the um, brief slay bracket that uh, the Vico offer and we used on the project. Um, and we were just discussing earlier, actually, the, um, the, the, the brief slay bracket is designed, it doesn't take much of an engineer to, to, to realize that it's actually quite um, efficient at supporting vertical loads. Um, it, it doesn't support and isn't rated to provide any lateral loading at all or support any lateral loading. Um, so the, the, pretty much the, the system was designed where we had a, a top fin that was fixed back to the structure, bottom fin that was in many cases actually fixed down to the, the concrete foundation. And the idea of this Brie Soleil uh, bracket was just to locate the two timbers um, next to each other. So that when you looked at the sight lines for the building, um, the both faces of the internal and outside uh, timbers line line through. Um, um, yeah, and then, then as, as, as I mentioned earlier, we, we were really up against an unknown at the time. Um, Brexit was was coming coming along, and um, we had no idea how that would uh, affect the marketplace. So there was a concentrated period of time where we, we, a lot of effort went into procuring this timber um, so we could get it out of Europe before, before, um, before Brexit. And this is, this is the remnants of Steve's work um, trying to coordinate with, uh, with Duncan's um, structures and, and changes, um, late changes that were going on to, to get us to a, a list of, um, of sections that we could then, uh, th then procure. So we, we optimized that. Added what we thought would be plenty of uh, plenty of surplus and and placed the order, um, and that that was the start of it. Um, so I'm now just going to talk about the, the 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 sequences or how we decide to split the the building up to to manufacture it. It had nothing to do with the uh, the way that Steve intended you to walk through the building. It was uh, more more the way that it happened. So we 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 started looking at this and. Um, realized very quickly that, um, in actual fact, let me, let me just use this, uh, this slide just to identify what I'm talking about very roughly about the phases. So the phase one is this spine that comes down the middle of the building like a T-shape. Um, phase two, we then built the, uh, the reception um, area. Number three, we uh, built the multi-use room, the lecture room, yoga room that was referred to earlier at the back. Uh, number four was the cloistered walkway. Um, number five was, I refer to it as the portico, it's the open area in front of the, uh, the reception area. And finally, um, the, 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 the temple at the end of it. So I'll just go into and um, quickly break these down. Simply. Have so ask you to speed up a little bit there, Nick, if that's okay. Sure, sure. Yeah, the, um, this is the, 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 the spine of the building. And um, the, the reason why it's put into our package um, uh, originally, it was simply a buildability um, problem of how do we hold all these uh, sticks of timber up in the air vertically without putting temporary props on them. So it's decided that we'd start here and that would enable both us to continue and enable the, um, the general, um, the, the, the carpentry uh, company on site to build the timber walls and the, uh, and, and the roof cassettes. So um, that's the, 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 the spine, all uh, connected with the concealed connectors and just with the addition of what was new to us at the time, a couple of bar booker uh, plates so that we could uh, satisfy the, the uh, bending moments on that uh, main goalpost frame. Um, 
dip through this uh, this a little bit. The the interesting thing here is this is um, if we just go to item number three, the, the we, we we came up with a constraint on 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 site whereby we couldn't fit a concealed fixing capable of of holding the bending moments into the section that uh, that we were using uh, throughout the building. So this is one of the few instances, and we'll go through the, the others just quickly um, in the next few slides, where we had to use a, uh, a secondary uh, bespoke bracket with a gusset on, and that was just um, a gusseted plate on it. And that's just where the um, we sat it on top of the uh, beam and uh, the column and rafter, and it was hidden in the uh, in the ceiling of the building, um, so not visible thereafter. And uh, num number four was pretty much the biggest um, design change we had to make. Originally, the, the uh, inherited model design intent was for the portico to be self-standing. And that uh, basically meant that we had to support the, or there was a column adjacent to the, and in front of the rear glaze screen um, that supported the, uh, the, the, the portico and rafters. The problem with that, it meant that uh, to actually replace any glass, if, uh, if there's a problem further down the line, we'd have to dismantle the, uh, the portico to literally to remove one piece of glass. So there's a pretty um, fundamental design change there where we um, uh, took the, the rafters of the portico back to sit on the internal, internal columns of the, um, of the, the reception. Again, if we, if we need to move on, not, uh, not much to say here. Um, aesthetically, um, just we, we started to include a whole load of purlins. From a structural point of view, they uh, they enable us to um, constrain the, the the rafters to stop them rolling um, rather than using traditional uh, noggins because it uh, the, the whole roof space was visible and um, it provided the separation from the wall to the ceiling that uh, that Steve was was looking for. So a double win there. And uh, number two is again one of the few areas where we end up with. Um, a, a, a moment uh, frame that we couldn't satisfy with the uh, with the original timbers. So um, a couple of extra brackets, a double dot beam there, and columns back down to the floor to um, to satisfy that was the was the solution. Um, really, the simplest part of it, which is what, you, what uh, apart from the temple, the thing that stands out on the uh, on the pictures from the, the central courtyard, is the the, the cloisters. And um, really simple design, um, pretty straightforward. On this, we just routed out the, uh, the, the rafters on the top so that the, all the services voids could run uninterrupted around, around the building and all were hidden by the, uh, by the ceiling that went between those rafters. Um, number five, we get back to that, uh, that, that portico and we've just discussed the majority of it. So I think we can, can skip over, over that. And finally, um, the, the temple, which um, yeah, the reason I was smiling, I hadn't seen any of those, uh, those uh, intent in models where um, Duncan uh, and, and Steve had obviously been scratching their heads over a problem that we, we walked into. So to get, to, to get that to, to, to work, um, the biggest problem was uh, the, the moment forces up on, on top of that and trying to make that with a concealed fixing. We discussed a whole load of um, of options. One of them was to literally wrap the whole um, the temple with a, a steel band um, and, and tension it on site. Um, but practically, we we uh, decided it would be very difficult to do. And uh, so we we designed these um, these plate fixings. Um, the reason for the size of them is to the amount of screws uh, that were needed to to satisfy the shear and um and the, the the screw centers not only did it combine by holding the the top of the structure together the top of the frame structure it also has that vertical fin plate uh, which was the the top we, we used as the top fixing for the external fins that um that i referred to earlier uh, just so the same the, the the fins were held in exactly the same way throughout the building um i matt that's um I'm perfectly happy to finish there if you want to move on to some, some questions. Hey, well, thank you very much. Um, thanks, thanks to all three of you for a, for a fantastic introduction to a great, great project. So if you want to um, stop, stop sharing your screen now, um, Nick. Um, if, uh, 
if everybody doesn't mind just staying on for a bit, we'll, we'll just 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 have a couple of questions. I see, Steve, you've done a sterling job answering quite a, quite a few of them. And I think what we might do is is just uh, share quite a quite a lot of them and, and perhaps see if we can answer any we don't have time for. There was one that I just wanted to quickly pick up on, which was um, fire design. Did you have any challenges with fire design for the exposed timber in the temple space? And also, I suppose, well, a question from me is just what was what were the client's attitude to timber and did they have any kind of concerns on that front? So that's, I guess, for everyone. Well, I, th I think um, with, with the nature of the work that they do in the services, and the connection to earth and nature, nature and the natural world, it was always seen as a, a part of the brief for the building to be built from natural materials. Obviously, there was a financial implication as to whether we went with timber or um, steel. Um, but there were also kind of spiritual reasons for the use of timber in terms of the way the services emit um, a kind of prayer to the to, to the wider earth and so there was a real kind of push towards natural materials not using steel and i think in terms of the the question about fire we we had a few issues with the the client's insurance and kind of providing enough information to demonstrate that the building um would stay standing in event of the type of fire and we also quite complex kind of um, fire detection systems in that um, triple height space where we had smoke aspirating detectors um, and all sorts. Um, Nick and Duncan, do you want to add anything to that? I mean, it is the, the timber frames treat with a, 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 a paint on surface spread of flame uh, product and it's a single story building. So fire really, other than no, it's not. It's not an essential item as part of the, the you know, the, the building rigs. There's no, there's no, there's no means of escape which is affected by uh, a lack of fire protection generally to the primary frame. So it's not really a consideration, other than say, you know, uh, well, yeah, it's not. It's not. It's not. For, for a single story building, it's, it's not required and therefore not essential, and therefore a cost a cost item that doesn't want doesn't want to be done. Timber can be, I mean, timber has its own natural defense against fire, which is charring. So you have 0.7 millimeters per, per minute on each of these sections. And um, you know, so there is actually an inherent built in natural defense against fire in any case. I suppose, but you know, projects of this nature uh it's more of a vandalism issue during site there's a few projects that have had uh fires during their construction which are an issue but, uh, you know, now, you've now noticed we had another question that was asking about protection of, of, of timber during construction um i i guess as much from from uh moisture as well as as, as from fire um didn't so any so i mean uh the the the, the glue lamb is much more stable than say uh, an LVL product. The one, the three products that we had on screen, the, the, the CLT, the glue lamb are much better performing in, 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 in the rain that we see in, in, in this climate. Um, and, and so in terms of tolerances, if we had an LVL, which is a beach material, it would have been much more difficult to control the movements of that once if we hadn't had a temporary cover over the building. In um, truth, it was actually very difficult to protect the building, uh, the timber, the exposed timber during the construction. I mean, you saw the construction phases that Nick brought up on screen. And these are uh, big pieces of um, glue lamp, each with their own connections. So whilst it went up relatively quickly, there was a long period where the timber frame was exposed to all sorts of weather conditions. We had all of the glue laminated um structure pre-treated with an exterior oil to kind of manage that but then the process of making those sections completely weathertight took a long time and um, there were some kind of hairy site visits i would say where we could see storm damage essentially on the on the timbers eventually it dried out but i would say it was a nervous time great thank you for that um 
Cu couple of um, quite technical specific questions here, um, which you sort of you may have actually covered in the presentation, but uh, have a question on how were the moment connections for the lantern frames formed? I don't know if that's one anybody would like to pitch in on whether. To Nick, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know it's a, it, it causes um, a whole load of headaches. As I said, it was it was something that we um, we knew the moment forces up there. We didn't realise the size of them, and then when you when you turn that back and and try and fit something that is concealed at that point in time, that was our, our brief inside the timber section. It became impossible, um, and that's why we ended up with these secondary um, steel plates um, up on top of the. Um, the, the, I still call it the, the roof parapet, if you look at the detail there. And it conveniently above that connection, that kind of branching connection, there was a zone for you to hide your bracketry in below the ceiling, below the roof finishes. So. Yeah, that's what it, I mean, the, the roof parapet, Duncan, yeah, it uh, stands up about what, half meters, isn't it, I think? So they were, it was fully fixed, top and bottom, so these, these kind of uh, portal frames, for want of a better word, the 48 portal frames acting in each of the circumferential directions are working as a pair uh, in, in every few degrees. So uh, that you only needed half a dozen of them to deal with the uh, uh, transverse wind loading, um, leeward and windward on each side of the, the lantern. Um, so we just passed on the the base, the base moments and stiffnesses required, and Nick uh, did, did the detailing. Okay. Um, maybe we just have to, time for one more. Um, yes, I mean, there was a, a another another very specific technical question. How did you review the torsional forces on the dome as a whole? Which presumably would lead to minor axis bending in the individual column elements. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody's so, so, so I'm referring to you, Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> but we have we gave you we only we only gave you primary primary moments in those because we only need a, a collection, a group, if you like. You can imagine on plan uh, the circumference of the group. So we had the, these large push pull forces across the sway of the building. So we didn't we didn't have to deal with torsional forces in terms of uh, the. The applied pressures on each side. We had a group coupling up to deal with those. Um, so, yeah, and in fact, the the fenestration on the outside acts to create a vortices shedding, which actually reduces the wind loads on the building because it uh, manages to shed shed the wind loading rather than attract it. So there's actually less drag forces on the building because of the fins on the external uh, surface. Thank you very much. You made the uh, engineers and the audience very, very happy with those answers, I suspect. Thank you. Um, I, there are a few other questions, but what I think we might do is, um, is round them all up and, and maybe if, if you'd be kind enough to perhaps uh, answer them outside of, of the uh, webinar and we'll, and we'll circulate them to all attendees because we really should be wrapping up right now. But um, so all that remains to say is I'm going to oh, share... Hang on, hang on. I just I just thought for those that have stood the course of the whole presentation, um, if there is time, Matt, um, just to share the, this video. Shall I go for it? I just needed to un unmute. Yes, yes, go ahead. Go for it. Okay. So it's just a short film that we've had um, commissioned for the building. <laughs>
Thank you very much for that. Um, so again, uh, thank you to all three panel panelists. Um, I'm just going to uh, leave you with um, a bit, little bit of information about um, our next webinar, which will be a Durley China Environmental Hub on Wednesday the 13th of March, again at one o'clock. There's a little collage of uh, some pictures of this uh, fantastically sustainable um, example of uh, reuse in, in architecture. So um, you'll be receiving uh, information about that later. And if you, if you haven't already um, booked your tickets for that, you can do so on the um, TD UK uh, website as of now. So uh, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your weekend, uh, weekend afternoon. Thank you.